It's a landmark case that people either claim is true or a total hoax and nonsense. The more you dig in, though, you realize sightings of similar crafts have occurred repeatedly ever since. And you end up asking yourself, why was Gulf Priest discredited again? Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in again. Ed Walters was a general contractor and had been working late the night of November 11th, 1987, when a light in his front yard caught his attention. He was not the only witness, but the primary one, and with Polaroid pictures, which are very hard to fake. He had gone to the window to see a glowing object hovering above the treetops about 200 feet away. He rushed outside to get a better look, and before his eyes, he was staring at a lit up object that looked sort of like a cake top, a highly unusual shape in the annals of UFO sightings. It had a row of dark squares with windows between them, and the craft seemed to be heading to the road in front of his house and lowering down. That's when he ran inside to grab a Polaroid camera and snapped five photos before he found it almost directly above his head. He was hit by a bluish beam and was lifted from the ground. He felt immobilized when he heard a telepathic voice speaking inside of his head. Don't worry, it said, we will not harm you. The next thing he remembers is waking up. The object was gone. A few days later, he walked into the editor's office of the Gold Breeze Sentinel newspaper, armed with the Polaroid photos, and the rest is history. He and the Gold Breeze sightings, along with his Polaroid photos, became an instant worldwide phenomenon. He started off disguising his identity. The paper initially printed, witnessed by Mr. X, but Ed had another encounter on the 20th with a humming sound in his ear and voice communicating to go outside. It happened a third time on December 2nd, and Ed woke up at 3.30 a.m. by the sound of a barking dog. He walked to the French doors of his bedroom and opened the blinds. Outside, about 10 feet away, a four-foot-tall creature with a large head and big black eyes was staring right back at him. He fell down from the shock and claims the alien started walking away. He said he chased it to a vacant field near his house he saw the craft again, and it picked up the creature through a blue beam. A fourth sighting occurred on December 5th, and this time Ed was armed with a camera and took a second set of photographs. Now he came forward as himself, and the local newspaper confirmed he was Mr. X. The Mutual UFO Network of Florida contacted Ed, offered him support, and proclaimed they believed his story. Walter Andrus, Florida State Director of MUFON, studied the case for the next three years and concluded Gulf Breeze was a real UFO encounter and one of the most incredible cases of modern history. In months to come, Ed and his wife witnessed several sightings, with blackouts lasting over an hour. On one occasion, a blue beam chased his wife as she tried to run away. He remembers multiple beings staring at him through a window and telepathically communicating, showing pictures of dogs and writings identifying each dog. He took 32 pictures overall, over 19 encounters, all at Gulf Breeze, and he shared a detail many have expressed since including witnesses of the 1997 Phoenix Lights that a calming humming sound in one ear signifies a contact with a UFO. For what purpose is a topic for another episode. Dr. Bruce McAbee was called to investigate and he agreed the Polaroids were not faked. They looked real to him, an optical physicist of the US Navy. And while Polaroids are incredibly hard to fake, not everyone agreed, even within the UFO community. The Center for UFO Studies did not believe the story and claimed the photographs were doctored. Dr. Robert Nathan of NASA claimed there was evidence of double exposure and the lights cast to the ground by the objects were abnormally big. Ed Walter's credibility was further damaged by discussions he was having and involved cash with the National Enquirer to buy exclusive rights to his photos and the William Morrow & Co. publisher of Whitley Strieber's bestsellers 
communion and transformation, prepared to pay Ed a $200,000 advance on a book deal that was released in 1990 under the title The Goldbury Sightings, The Most Astounding Multiple Sightings of UFOs in History, published as non-fiction. It further didn't help that Ed had offered Dr. Bruce Maccabee $20,000 for a prologue, conflating his independent and expert analysis of his photographs. A miniseries option deal with ABC worth $400,000 was also discussed, but the series was never made. You can see how damaging this entrepreneurship was to the cause of truth and perception. I believe the two can be separated because the difference between making income off of something that accidentally has fallen into the lap of a person with modest means to claiming that a person made it all up intentionally to profit from it, imagine following through with it, first making the realistic yet fake photos using a model, presumably, along with all kinds of clever marketing outreach to make deals worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and then finding yourself on the defense against the media, multiple individuals coming at you with their own agenda and the press, finding yourself on the Oprah Winfrey show, defending your hoax publicly, that is a far cry. Let's take a listen. This book is called The Gulf Breeze Sightings, and it's about, literally, the sightings on the Gulf Breeze. Exactly. Um, two and a half years ago, I saw what I saw. I know what I saw was a UFO. During the last two and a half years, hundreds of my neighbors... And you say you know what you saw. I know what I saw because I have the photographs to prove what I saw it was not a helicopter or an airplane. Uh, people came forward by the droves, dozens and scores of people saying, yes, that's exactly what we saw. Uh, we saw it as lately as uh, April, just uh, several months ago, April the 14th, 15th, 16th, many dozens of people in a boat of a bridge. Saw and, the same thing. Saw the, saw the craft go overhead. Uh, airplanes descended after it, and it collapsed on itself and winked out. Now, I don't think we have the technology in our uh, science to do that. To wink out. To just wink out. Mm -hmm. um, they have videotapes showing, showing it winking out. Um, I support completely the idea that the government is covering this up. Ed Walters passed two polygraph tests overseen by Harvey McLaughlin Jr. He also underwent a psych evaluation performed by a clinical psychologist, Dan Overlaid, and was found to be of normal intelligence without paranoia, schizophrenia, propensity to making stuff up, or any other mental ailment that would trigger the creation of a fantastic parallel existence to get attention or for financial gain. He simply didn't fit that profile. He was normal, like you and me. Investigative journalist Jackie Brooks, associate editor of the News Journal, took a trip to Gulf Breeze to talk to Ed Walter's neighbors. Many came forward to corroborate his story and sightings including a Monsanto employee, Arthur Huffert, highly trustworthy according to Brooks, as were Dr. Fenner McConnell, a local pathologist and his wife, also eyewitnesses. To Jackie Brooks, the question wasn't, did they see something? The question was, what did they see? After successfully photographing the same type of craft in yet another occasion, using a MUFON supplied camera, with four locked compartments, creating a four-shot effect, near impossible to doctor. He was able to record an object in the sky with a video camera, also supplied by MUFON, showing an object winking out, if you will, while a person at the beach, in the same frame, goes nowhere. Still, events kept occurring that discredited Ed Walters. When he sold his house and moved, a 3D model mysteriously appeared in his old house attic, claimed to be proof of his fakery. The model was 9 inches long across the top and 5 inches high, attached to two 6-inch foam plates, using yellow plastic film to create the light effect on the inside. It was very carefully crafted, and a local teenager, the son of a man running for mayor of Galbreeze, claimed Ed tried talking him into being a co-witness. Free publicity for dad. This is when Mufon decided to drop him, declaring him untrustworthy. His claim that this was planted to discredit him fell on deaf ears. Let's listen to his defense again on Oprah in the um, mid 90s. If you think that this model looks anything like, if you think this model looks anything like the photographs of what the people around Gulf Breeze are seeing, 
then you need to have some glasses. Uh, the, the prank that was pulled by putting a model in a house that I used to live in a year and a half ago was an effort by whomever to discredit the sightings. And it shows me that there is a very definite cover-up going on trying to make this phenomena go away. And any big case that happens across the United States will be ridiculed. And I've heard these same stories, unsubstantiated stories about models and witnesses coming forward over and over and there's no truth to them. Since that time, events continue to happen. And this is where our interest in revisiting Gulf Breeze comes in. In 1990, in Canaima, Venezuela, this photo was taken and observed by dozens of witnesses that agree the photo correctly describes what they saw. Even before Gulf Breeze, in 1980 at Yorkshire, England, Alan Godfrey shot this object. It was not compared to Ed Walter's photos at the time. Art Hufford took this one in Gulf Breeze in 1991, and Bland Pugh took these photos in 1993 and 1996. And on May 30th and 31st, 2009, in Wisconsin, Paul Scheeler shot these photos over a span of two days, during daytime and at night. And then there's this video from Gulf Breeze shot in 1995, not by Ed Walters, but by Michael Hawkins. They all look near identical to the cake top UFO witnessed by Ed Walters in 1987. And despite MUFON's rejection of supporting Ed Walters' testimony, it is still listed within their lexicon of UFOs shapes and sizes right there, number I-5. Ed and Francis Walters together took over 32 photos on various cameras, some showing the Blu-ray, some partly obscured by trees, some shot on the lock and key camera provided by MUFON. What persuaded me are not the Ed Walters photographs themselves, but the corroborating photographs, videos and eyewitness account from multiple other people around the world at different times, each essentially showing the exact same craft. Campaigns to discredit eyewitness accounts conducted by various parties for various reasons has an incredibly damaging effect on the life and reputation of the people involved. They become labeled as lunatics in the eyes of their social environment. It causes emotional and psychological irreparable harm. That's why discrediting campaigns by governments, media, or others are so effective. The media likes discreditation as much as they like the story itself because both produce equal amounts of sensation, and sensation sells. As to who else was behind this discreditation, that's a topic for another episode. Regardless, the discreditation with all its irreparable harm discourages others to step forward as well, and therefore does not support the pursuit of truth regarding unexplained phenomena. With a collection of photos taken by multiple people across the world, spanning over 20 years, showing the exact same UAP, I suggest it's time we recredit Ed Walters and thank him by confirming the reality of the Gulf Breeze sightings. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, the place for exploration of all things unidentified. Each day, Let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.